money. Money makes the world go around, the world go around, the world go around. Money makes the world go around, it makes the world go round. In a buck or a pound, a mark of a pound, a buck or a pound is all that makes the world go around. That clinking, clanking sound can make the world go round. Money, 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 money. If you happen to be rich, should you feel like a knight? Well, you started by having some assignments that were talking about what is it like to be a producer. In this lecture, we're going to talk a little more about that. In the 1980s, Broadway conquers the global economy. This is America, and unless you can make it, it don't count, as they say in the producers. Never put your money in the show. From Cats to The Lion King, from Rent to Wicked, it's all on Broadway. The American musical has economically changed Broadway. Take, for example, 42nd Street itself. Completely different when I was there. I know it seems like ancient times now, but in the 70s, 42nd Street was virtually all porno houses. Uh, if you even go down now to see the New Amsterdam Theater, the New Amsterdam Theater had oh, so many Disney shows in it now, but it started with The Lion King and only like 20 years ago, that building was a dilapidated ruin and 42nd Street was a jungle of urban decay. But today the fortunes of American musical have changed all of that. Back in the day, Florin Ziegfeld once produced his follies in the New Amsterdam Theater. People have been on that stage, even just to go up and touch that stage. That's where Fred Astaire was, the Marx Brothers, Al Jolson. They were in that actual historical landmark of a theater. But it is a functioning theater now because musical theater, Broadway, actually drives a lot of the economy in New York City, which is why everybody's so excited that Broadway will be opening back up again. <laughs> the only difference is in the past, it used to be that you could be a producer and be a person, Florin Ziegfeld, David Merrick. Now it's media corporations like Disney that have become the new impresarios. The Broadway stages are the same. The actors are the same. The orchestra, the same. The business of show business has changed if you want to be a producer. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer, lunch at Sardis every day. Producer, sport a top hat in the game. I want to be a producer and drive those chorus girls insane. Broadway in some way, any way. He even jokingly said he would work in the men's room of a Broadway theater just to be close to Broadway. Mel Brooks loves Broadway, and in fact, in every single movie that you can see that's a Mel Brooks movie, is Young Frankenstein, name them, name them. There's hundreds, <laughs> feels like. But in every movie, he takes a nod to Broadway moments. The producers, the show, is ostensibly a satire send-up of Broadway types and supposedly holds Broadway characters up to ridicule. And we all know it's exactly the opposite, that it's actually a love letter to Broadway 
to Broadway's tradition, to its history. Musical comedy seemed almost revolutionary in 2001 when Mel Brooks adapted his 1968 film, The Producers, to the Broadway stage. The musical had a nerdy accountant named Leo Bloom and the eccentric Max Bialy stock and unscrupulous producer who takes money from little old ladies to finance his shows. As Max Bialystock says in the show, I'm but a lying, double-crossing, two-faced, backstabbing, despicable crook, but I had no choice. I was a Broadway producer. <laughs> Max Bialystock, the character, flirted with the ladies over 85 years old on his leather couch in his office. Anyone can throw a hundred dollars here or there. This guy knew things. It was a much simpler time, so this particular producer that Mel Brooks was basing the character on did prey on these wealthy old ladies, but they preyed on him too. They would dutifully write out the check to Cash, which was always the name of his latest play. Oh yes, I'm producing a show and it's called Cash. Write me a check. And they'd say, gee, that's a funny name for a play. And he would usually say, so is the Iceman cometh. Hmm? The character of Max Bialystock is really someone who wants to become a great impresario. And of course, he wants to make money. Also, the show lampoons the joke that the cardinal rules of being a Broadway producer, number one, never put your own money in the show, and number two, never put your own money in the show. That is taboo. But of course, every producer, myself included, has a tendency to do that when you're down to the wire. <laughs> The show The Producers became the first must-see musical comedy in decades and tickets were so hard to come by that the producers of The Producers could charge $480 for each VIP seat. That's controversial, um, but I don't know really why it should be. Look at what happened to Hamilton. $1,000 tickets, for heaven's sake. What was happening was that you had a big hit and all the money was being made by the scalpers. People would stand outside the theaters and say, I have tickets for tonight, tickets for tonight, and they would charge double. People had nothing to do, these people, scalpers, had nothing to do with the show's creation, and they were reaping all the benefits from it. So the producers of Broadway got together and formed an organization, and they felt that there had to be something that they could do to stop that. The economic gamble of a new musical in the 21st century is so intense that few producers can afford to go it alone. It's not easy to put on a Broadway musical. It takes a village to put on a Broadway musical. It's very different now than years ago. And you'll find that there are many names above the titles with the title of producer. <sighs> the show The Producers took a total of 14 producers and $10 million to bring that musical comedy to Broadway and more and more Hollywood and media moguls were getting into the act. But it wasn't so long ago that just such an insane larger than life figure dominated the great white way. And he was called the abominable showman, David Merrick. Let me give you a little. to work with. He was kind of a scoundrel in a kind of theater way, you know, you, you kind of admire it in a weird way. He was part of the glamour of the theater. He would take fake ads. He would fake quotes uh, that no reviewer had ever said about his show. 
but he'd put them on the posters. Uh, he was kind of a nasty guy. He was a mean guy, but he was a promoter. And over a career that spanned 40 years, David Merrick produced dozens of shows, often going it alone without any other partners. Six productions were directed and choreographed by Gower Champion, and they were all David Merrick shows, including the seismic hit, Hello, Dolly, in 1980. Merrick turned to Gower Champion again to mount 42nd Street, a backstage musical in which Peggy Sawyer goes out a youngster and comes back a star. Think of Broadway, damn it! Come on along and listen to the lullaby of Broadway. The hip hooray and ballyhoo. The lullaby of Broadway. The rumble of the subway train. The rattle of the taxi. It's early in the morning. Manhattan babies don't sleep tight until the dawn. Good night, baby. Good night, milkman's on his way. Sleep tight, baby. Let's call it a day. Listen to the lullaby of old Broadway. Forty Second Street was one of the first movie musicals adapted to the stage, and its cast was more than double the size of most shows on Broadway. The Lullaby of Broadway. David Merrick had taken the profits from a movie that he produced and bought out his only two investors for like a million apiece, and he now owned the whole thing. There's a story about a friend finding Merrick alone on stage one night, and he invited him to go to a poker game. And Merrick's response was, this is my gamble. This is my poker game. Merrick decides he does not want critics to follow the usual system of reviewing in a final preview. He has declared the critics are gonna come to opening night, come hell or high water, no preview. The Times and other newspaper critics responded with, fine, we'll just buy tickets for a last preview. We're not going to let the producer tell us how to cover a show. So then, and this is the kind of moxie that Merrick had, he starts canceling previews, which is a gutsy thing to do because it ends up costing him money. He changed the opening date. He announced there was a bomb threat, a rat in the theater, meaning that there was a critic in the theater. We, most of the actors had no idea of what was going on. Frank Rich, a New York Times critic, tells a story about him. The show ends, and I'm stopped by a man. He says, I got to talk to you for a second. And I said, uh, can you call me tomorrow? I'm on a deadline by this point. My wife is on the street where she's discovered there are no cabs waiting, and she's frantically trying to hail a cab so we can get back to the Times. He said, but you don't understand. He said, Gower Champion is dead. I said, what? Gower Champion had directed the show. He was a man in his mid-fifties, and I thought, this is a hoax. Is it Merrick? He was famous for his hoaxes. I mean, what the hell is this? Merrick waited until the curtain falls, and then the curtain calls, and they all bow, and came walking out, and he said, this is a very sad occasion. And we laughed, because it was a musical comedy. And he said, I have to tell you that earlier this evening, Gower Champion passed away. 
that was our reaction. <laughs> that was the audience's reaction. It was oh, just uh, shocking. It turns out he died from a very, very rare blood cancer. Merrick had kept it a secret, and it was front page news all over the world. <laughs> he had announced Champion's death from the stage, and even people who didn't know what 42nd Street was, or who Gower Champion was, or who David Merrick was, they all knew it now. That was Merrick, the flair for the press. He was really the end of an era, a no-limit poker player. He would go all in. 42nd Street ran for over eight years on Broadway, but the next musical to occupy the Winter Garden Theater would play for a record-breaking 18 years. And its producer was Cameron McIntosh. And during the 80s, he redefined the formula for success in musical theater. To create a show on Broadway, which is something he'd never done, he was from London after all, he had never done. He thought, I think I can do this. But moving the show from London to Broadway cost him nearly twice as much money. The rule of thumb is, that a show that costs seven to eight million dollars in London, here it will cost 12 plus. I can't even count million dollars. Macintosh's big break came when he produced a new work by Andrew Lloyd Webber, who had composed Broadway hits such as Ye Vita and Jesus Christ Superstar. The show was Cats, and it was derived from a series of T.S. Eliot poems for children. Basically, everybody thought they were demented. It would be a complete disaster saying things like, that's going to be a catastrophe. <laughs> it's the worst thing you've ever seen in your life. It's a dog. Macintosh said, I listened to it all and I said, Andrew, this is something I don't want to get out of. This is about, uh, uh, I think it must be really about Queen Victoria, right? Uh, Queen Victoria is the main cat and Israeli and Gladstone are the other cats and then there you are you know poor cats am I missing this and Andrew Lloyd Webber <laughs> took a painful long pause and says uh Cameron it's about cats and we just never discussed it again <laughs> it's just about cats <laughs> why this show should not have worked. And yet, Cats became a phenomenon in London and earned the biggest advance ticket in Broadway history. It was entirely unconventional and had almost no storyline, yet 
audiences could not resist those dancing felines. <laughs> a lot of the success had to do with the fact that the show reached across perceived barriers of every kind. First of all, barriers between generations. It was possible for young children, their parents, and their grandparents to all go to the theater together and all get something that was completely delightful all at the same time in the same show. The hit song of the show, ah, I'm going to find it for you, the hit song of the show recalling the faded glory of Grisabella, the glamour cat, has been recorded in dozens of languages. Let me let you hear a little of that. import became the longest running show in Broadway history. For Cameron McIntosh though, that was only the beginning. I think you'll recognize this too. can relate to any of the protests that we are experiencing today. After Cats, Cameron McIntosh imported other blockbusters from London and Paris, including Les Mis, Les Miserables, The Phantom of the Opera, and Miss Saigon. Broadway audiences thrilled to the emotionally resonant story, stirring pop ballads and colorful spectacle. It was the spectacle that really beguiled them. And most audiences found that thrilling. And it was actually truly the case that we began to applaud things that are only spectacle, like the chandelier falling in Phantom of the Opera. Uh, the audiences applauded the sons of in Les Mis who had to keep up with the turntable on the set. As they were running, the floor was actually moving. And the audiences really appreciated how difficult it was to make these things look so gorgeous. If you're dealing with big themes, 
you've got to have it big visually as well as big musically. You're seeing emotions painted larger than life. And if you paint them smaller than life, you might as well sit at home and watch television or look in the mirror. I think you can have a huge hit in London, and you can have great successes that go around the world. But in the musical theater, that hit also needs to be a hit on Broadway. And that is what it takes when it goes on its final journey of the world. So Cameron McIntosh could produce in London, but he needed these shows to be popular on Broadway as well. This is the overture to Miss Saigon. Macintosh conceived of Broadway as the centerpiece for marketing shows around the world. His approach to promotion was both radical and simple. The ads for his shows carried no quotes, only the sleek, unforgettable logos for the shows themselves. Cameron is one of the last of the guys with a real singular vision of how he thinks a show should be produced, what he thinks is the branding, what should it look like. like how should the play play? And he was very active as an engaged, creative producer. There just aren't many of those types around anymore. Here's another song from Miss Saigon called Sun in the Moon. Michelle Schoenberg. Macintosh's four top shows have grossed a revenue of over eight million, I'm sorry, let me say that again, eight billion dollars worldwide. That's more than Star Wars, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Jurassic Park, and Titanic combined. So the, uh, the payout, if you can make it work, is pretty big. Tomorrow is the judgment day. Tomorrow we'll discover why. 
each era, there are shows that break the rules. And history proves that every 20 years or so, <laughs> or 30 years or so, you're going to have to reinvent the rules. You don't throw out everything you know, but you go, you look, you need to put yourself back into, you know, that line from the Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland 1940s movies and think, hey kids, let's put on a show. And you have to figure out how are you going to do that? How are you going to be able to break new ground and create something new? Something, something that is stirring, really catches ground. this audience, it's just begun. this generation. Edges are blurring you guys had a lot of good ideas for that. And yesterday is gone. Feel the flow, hear what's happening, hear what's happening. Don't you know? And we're the shapers, we're the names in tomorrow's papers, up to us men to show them. And it's up to us it's to show them. Time, breathe it in, worlds to change. Your plans for new musicals dealing with today's issues were very exciting to read. I only hope some of you actually follow through or give that idea to someone who can. So here we are. We're getting closer to the end of the course. We've only got a few more lectures to go. Please stay on top of things. You can get lost and out of hand so quickly. Go on my courses. I'll see you there if you have any questions or fall behind or need any help. You know how to email me and I'll get right back to you. Me with because we make tomorrow, and, you the words. and we make American Tell musical them theater happen. Up to us, how to show up. Our time, breathe it in. It's our time, breathe it in.